In this segment, we're going to be joined by Mike Bundrant, who is a psychologist, uh, very experienced in the realms of neuroscience, uh, linguistics. And in fact, this gets to just an amazing story. Here it is, published in the journal uh, Nature Neuroscience. This scientific study is entitled How Unrealistic Optimism is Maintained in the Face of Reality. Now, this is fascinating stuff. You'll want to tune in on this because it explains why about four out of five people in the general population, they have something different about their brains that doesn't allow them to code in to grasp the reality of something negative. This is why about 80% of the people you might see out there don't get it when it comes to false flag attacks or vaccines or fluoride in the water supply or how big government is really trying to destroy your freedoms and take away your rights rather than save you and protect you and do all these things. If you've ever asked the question, why don't people understand when I'm telling them about the reality that's out there, this scientific study could help explain that. So joining us to analyze this and give us further details is Mike Bundrant. He's also the publisher of a Healthy Times newspaper that you'll find throughout California and other regions. Uh, Mike, are you with us? I'm with you. How are you doing, Mike? I am doing great. Thank you for joining us today. And I really appreciate your input on this. What do you think about this study? Well, it's a very interesting study. Um, I have to say that it doesn't come as a total shock. Um, for anyone who, you know, thinks a little bit about human nature and what's going on around us, um, that, you know, people tend to hear what they want to hear, see what they want to see, and uh, sort of generate self-fulfilling prophecies about, you know, what works for them in terms of what they want. So it's not a total shock. Um, however, it's very, very interesting that they have actually – um, taking scans of people's brains and the way they work in, in, in the face of news that is worse than expected. And the, act, the frontal lobe actually shuts down, of course, not entirely, but it, it doesn't process information that is news that's worse than expected. It's fascinating, but it sort of confirms probably what a lot of people know. Well, the, let me read from the abstract of this study, again, which was published in the journal Nature Neuroscience. And in the abstract says, quote, highly optimistic individuals exhibited, quote, reduced tracking of estimation errors that called for negative update in right inferior prefrontal gyrus. These findings indicate that optimism is tied to a selective update failure. Now, th this is pretty technical language. What, what does that mean in layman's terms? Break it down. Make it even simpler for us, Mike. I'll make it even simpler. Basically, um, I guess you could say that opt overly optimistic people are brain damaged, Mike. <laughs> 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 well, uh, I, I guess that's. I think that's. I guess that's a little too simplistic. But here's the way that I understand this: that we are talking about these people in the study were presented with negative information, information that's worse than expected. And so if I, so if I, if you ask me, what, Mike, what's the chance that you'll get cancer in your lifetime? And I say, well, I, I'd say it's 10%. And you say, actually, the, the statistics, the data suggests that you have a 30% chance of getting cancer. If I'm one of these overly optimistic people, I will literally, my frontal lobe will not process that information. And I will not adjust my expectations accordingly, effectively keeping me in denial. And we see this across the population on, on many issues that, that I hinted at earlier that people, you know, when, when you tell people about, well, 9-11 was an inside job, let's say. Right. And they might reply, no, nah, it couldn't be. Be more optimistic. Why aren't you more optimistic? You hear that a lot in the deniers out there. Do you, do you think this helps explain cognitively what's happening in their brains? I think it actually explains what's happening in their brains. And let's talk a little bit about the role of denial. Denial is a is like fire. It's a precious gift and it's a dangerous enemy, depending on how you use it. If we didn't have the capability of denying certain realities or certain possibilities, then 
we would literally be overwhelmed with worry and fear from everything, uh, from did I leave the iron on when I left the house this morning to when am I going to die? If I couldn't filter out all there is to worry about in life and just effectively deny that and focus on what I want to focus on, none of us could function. Right. So there's a, there's a positive role for this, too, in, in the sense that this helps us adapt to reality. Or what about uh, the idea of holding out, you know, real hope for freedom, for example? How do we maintain optimism in the face of so much tyranny? That uh, this, this phenomenon actually could help us in that context. It, it, it could help us into that context, but we've got to get past the denial. In other words, in order for real optimism... Or, your, or pessimism, for that matter, to take place, we have to be dealing with the truth. So, for example, if I let's say that it's the tenth of the month and I only have a hundred dollars in my checking account to make it to the end of the month, which is not a lot of money, and if I could be optimistic or pessimistic about that, I could be optimistic and say, you know what, it's a challenge, but I'm going to find a way to make this work. I'm going to cut back. I can do X, Y, and Z. And I'm going to get to the end of the month, and I know I can make it happen, and, I'm, and so forth, and I come up with a plan. Or I could be pessimistic and say, oh, geez, I'm, you know, I, I, this, this, isn't, this isn't going to happen, and I'm going to you know, lose my house, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I have a choice to be optimistic or pessimistic. What we're talking about here, though, with this study is that I'm not even acknowledging how much money is in my checking account in the first place. So I'm just in a different reality. Yeah, denying reality. Well, I'm just denying reality in this situation, and that's what's dangerous. And so um, we have to get, we have to break through that barrier barrier of denial and and allow people, help people understand the reality of what's going on. Then let's be optimistic, but let's be optimistic based on the truth. There's really no problem, or very few problems. That we can't solve, right? But if we don't even look at the problems for what they are, there's, we don't have a prayer in solving them. And I think that's what's going on. Uh, as a culture, we're so in denial about just about everything. Well, the, what's extraordinary about this is this term now is going to become, I think, a, a part of mainstream vernacular. That term is unrealistic optimism. So folks... If you're listening, I want you to repeat that term a couple of times because you're going to hear it more and more. Unrealistic optimism is maintained in the face of reality, this story says. The, the, I had not really heard this term before, unrealistic optimism, and now we're seeing it as the title of a, a neuroscience article. I, I think that's quite fascinating. But in terms of practical aspects here, Mike, it seems like the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the key issue is how do we balance this in our own lives so that we can maintain optimism where it's required to keep moving forward and yet not be hoodwinked into a state of denial about what's really happening in the world around us? Right. Do, you, do you have any tips on, on that balance? I do. The principle is to learn to manage your own emotions and your own anxiety, to look at the truth, whether it's the truth about what's going on in the country or just the truth about how much money is in your checking account. To look at that truth um, is creates anxiety. I mean, there's there's a lot to be worried about in terms of what's going on. So the first thing to do is to learn to manage our emotions uh, on a to become more efficient in them. So the things that scare us, the things that we're uncomfortable with, to learn to look at those things in a way and get some skills to manage our state. Because if we can't do that. Denial is the tool, the, the default tool that we'll, that we'll resort to. The better we can manage ourselves, the less need we have for but, denial. But wait a minute, Mike. Why should we manage our own emotions? I thought the government was going to tell us when to be afraid, when to feel patriotic, uh, when, when to feel big, when to feel small. I mean, the government tells us how to feel about everything, like, like this pretext for war. Why? <laughs> Obviously, I'm being facetious, but... You know, it seems like the, the skill of, of, of managing our own emotions is not something that's really widespread throughout populations of the world. In fact, um, it's not taught in schools. Um, just like how to be in a relationship effectively. How do you have 
a healthy, uh, happy partnership or marriage? Uh, how do you control your anxiety? Uh, how do you make goals and plan for them and be efficient? None of this is taught. It's almost as if, Mike, the government does want us just to take their answers for it and follow them blindly. In other words, perhaps the, the greatest propaganda for unrealistic optimism and the denial that goes with it are the messages we get in the, in, in the mainstream media. And so learning to manage yourself, to me, is the first step toward taking an independent stand and taking control oh, of your life. Mike, this is a really good analysis you're offering us, and I have more questions for you. But first, do you have a website where people can learn more or see more of what you've written? Sure. Uh, my website is inlpcenter.com. Okay, inlpcenter.com. Mike Bundrant is our guest here to give us some analysis of this uh, study of, quote, unrealistic optimism uh, that was published in Nature Neuroscience. Now, uh, my question for you, Mike, is how do you think these other factors might play into this phenomenon that we are discussing here? For example, consuming fluoride, which we know numbs the mind, mm -hmm. taking psychiatric medications, which we also know can, can cause just craziness uh, in the brain, all kinds, you know, suicidal thoughts, even taking action on things like that. Uh, what about the, the toxic food additives that are out there? All, all these other toxic chemicals coming in, how might they interact with this phenomenon to potentially dull the minds of people and make them sort of zombie optimists? Is that, I mean, is that even the right term? That's actually a very good term. It's actually a very good term. Every chemical that we put into our body is either going to help us or hurt us play a role in supporting our organs uh, or not. And the brain, of course, is an organ, and the mind, you know, comes from the brain. So if you're going to do some work on yourself to the degree that you have brain-numbing chemicals in your body, it's just going to make that work more difficult. It'll feel sort of like digging through sludge yeah. a little bit. Um, is it impossible? Of course not. If you're taking some sort of medication um, or if you eat a lot of chemicals, does that mean you're a total zombie? No, of course not. You're not as sharp as you might be. Uh, but the, the key for everybody, no matter where you are, is to get started. Learn some ways to manage your mind. Learn some ways to reduce your anxiety. Learn how to think more clearly. Everybody, no matter where you're at right now, can in the next week or two learn to think uh, a several degrees more clearly, to learn to manage their emotions with 2 or 3% more efficiency, and to feel just a little bit better simply by practicing, let's say, meditation, simply by you know, practicing some cognitive behavioral techniques. Everybody can stay can, can take a step forward. It doesn't matter where you are. And the ideal, of course, is to become self-sufficient, where you don't need medication in order to feel okay. Right. And you're aware, you're able to be aware of what's going on with the food supply and the water supply so that you can take measures to avoid it. And there are ways to do that. Just extraordinary information, and I hope those of you listening here are really getting this. This is explaining the brain defect of those who can't see reality and who maintain what we're now calling zombie optimism. But I want to be clear about this. We are not opposed to optimism itself. In fact, I consider myself an optimist. I don't know about you, Mike. You're probably an optimist, too. I mean, I maintain optimism on issues like we are going to expose corruption. We are going to protect the planet in the way that really matters. Like, I'm optimistic about I'm going to learn permaculture and practice permaculture and grow more of my own food no matter what. I don't care what barriers are put in the way. I'm going to be optimistic about making progress. It seems like combining optimism with action is a real strategy for success. Yes, optimism combined with action based on reality is an incredible combination for success. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, it, it the, the odds don't have to be in your favor in order for you to succeed. So if I'm going to start a business, we all know that most businesses fail. Okay, but if I know that, if I go, wow, nine out of ten businesses fail within the first 
year of being in business. Okay, that's a truth. I'm not going to avoid that truth. I want to start a business anyways. And given the reality of how difficult it is, I'm going to make a list of everything that I need to do to give myself the best chance of success. I'm going to do the research. I'm going to make sure I'm well-funded, et cetera. We're just about to wrap this up. 20 seconds left. Anything else you want to add as we wrap up this segment with you? Yeah, absolutely. Even though that there is neuroscience and studies on the brain that show that the brain does certain things uh, in order to... Uh, to create certain outcomes, we can take cognitive control. We can influence whether or not that frontal lobe shuts down in the face of bad news. All right, good information from Mike Bundren. Thanks for joining us on this segment. Stay with us here. We'll be back with more breaking news here on The Alex Jones Show. Thank you.